steps of a warrior. People hear that, especially in church, and they kind of get this little, I don't know, maybe a background voice in their head going, yes, now I can glean something, or I can be a superhero. But uh, you're going to be disappointed if, with this. <laughs> I find that uh, in my own life, God has required me to make warrior type choices when I felt the least like making those choices. Now there might be some of you here when you hear the word warrior, it kind of cries into your personal life a little bit where you're at home with your wife and you feel the urge to grab a cape and run around the house yelling, I'm a warrior. And Next thing you know, you're looking around and your grandkids are staring at you like there's something wrong and they need to commit you. So <laughs> we're gonna we're probably not gonna go down that alley a whole lot. <laughs> so we're not looking at no uh, Maid Marian or Braveheart characters in this series. Instead, we're gonna be delving into spiritual power that is ours, a spiritual covering that is available and spiritual resources that we need to tap into. Now, I thought we're not going to be looking at fictitious scenarios, but biblical directives. The Bible has power for living that we need to learn from in order to live victorious lives. Now, I can unfortunately testify to this next illustration. If you have ever been in a situation where you're out muscled <laughs> and out maneuvered and you're in that corner with this thug in front of you getting ready to get the beating of your life, it's not a good feeling. I can tell you that. But you know what the good feeling is? When that buddy you got that's 290 pounds taps the guy on the shoulder and goes, is everything all right here, buddy? <laughs> that is a very good feeling. <laughs> so we're not capable of defending ourselves at all times. But we do have a warrior that is capable. He is above whatever circumstance that might be pushing us into a corner today. Now, most people nowadays might equate the term warrior with some uncouth barbarian. You know, some old movie you've seen with guys running around with armor stuff on them and living pretty much one step above the animals they're surrounded by. It may be a negative connotation in your mind, but we're gonna to try to attempt to reveal a different side of the warrior. You know, I remember being young a very long time ago, but I honestly can't remember ever feeling exhilarated by confrontation, by violent things. So in a way, like, when you think about being a warrior, you're thinking, well, I never really was into that. I wasn't into being in a situation where I would have to take up arms or have to fight like that. I just wasn't, it wasn't really in my DNA. I liked having fun and wrestling, but to actually have to fight wasn't really what I was thinking would be fun. And you might be here too thinking, I'm not a warrior. And I don't want to be some medieval kind of freak anyways. We are civilized after all, aren't we? But the heart of a warrior has valuable information for us to glean from. And I want to expose some of the lies that the devil has fed us and made us, this is going to hurt, <laughs> he has made us wimps rather than warriors. If Christ has called us to victory and to be free from fear, why would we settle for anything less? Now, like I said in the beginning, 
sometimes the term warrior is put on you and the request is made from God, so it's kind of hard to argue with him. But how do you how do you handle that when you're not feeling like a warrior? And God says, well, let's just see what he said. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Who is that? Well, that was Gideon. And his name literally in Hebrew means warrior. But at the time when the angel of the Lord said that to him, he was hiding out. <laughs> and I like what he says, because in verse 12 it says, the angel says to him, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Verse 13, Gideon's response is, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened? <laughs> and I think that's a pretty honest answer for most people. When circumstance rains down, and we're reading on one hand, I'm victorious. And on the other hand, we're going, then why is all this happening to me? Are you discouraged? Has life played a cruel trick on you? Are you backed into the corner, being confronted by something overwhelming? And then God is there tapping you on the shoulder saying, I'm with you, you are a warrior. And you're like, okay, if you say so. <laughs> now, I've been around a lot of people in church. I've been in church my whole life. Most of it, my brain was numb towards it because I wasn't interested. But there came a time when I did submit my will and my mind and everything of me to the Lord. But in all those years in the church, I've noticed you've got a few different types of attenders. And one of them is a, a Sunday attender. People that go to church, and that's pretty much where it ends. Jesus is more of a figment in their imagination, made up of ideas and ideologies that suit their lifestyle. And then number two was, you got your Sunday pretenders. They're living hard, hardcore for the devil all week. But on the occasional Sunday, they go just to make themselves feel good. And you know what, there's probably a few different versions of, you know, different things I'm sure you could come up with. But then you got, you got your warrior Christian. Now they are committed to learning, to growing, to persevering and overcoming. Persevering was a key word. <laughs> overcoming is a key word. Growing is a key word. And you know what? They might take the shape of a little old grandma. Or they might take the shape of a teenager from a divorced home that they've latched on to God because he's the only father they got left. It could be a bookkeeper in an office, but beneath the surface, there is a warrior. Don't underestimate these people. Their faith is incredible. There's one more. It's called the mimicker. <laughs> I didn't make that word up even though it sounds made up. It sounds like it should come off of the show Master of Distasy, but no. We have the mimicker. The mimicker might start off meaning well, but can oftentimes be derailed because their experiences are not their own. They're copying, they're collecting accolades to reaffirm who they think they are or should be. But it is a distant, not personal. They have certificates that tell them they are spiritual warriors but they know they are not. They usually end up living a defeated life because to have the power of Christ, we must accept the terms of Christ. If we are educating and collecting pieces of paper telling us how good we've done, who 
Who's getting the glory? And I think that's a good test for each one of us. When we do anything, who's getting the glory? I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but if we will succeed as believers in Christ, it is his presence we need. As I was thinking about how subtle the enemy is and his attempts to derail Christians, it got me thinking, where does the term spiritual warrior even come from? This is not good news, by the way. <laughs> one of the terms, and probably one of the most prevalent ones out there, comes from the Tibetan Buddhism. For the Buddhist, it is a gain, complete spiritual awareness, to gain complete spiritual awareness, to combat self-ignorance, which is the ultimate source of suffering according to Buddhist philosophy. So the belief is that of suffering, meditation, spiritual and physical labor, and good behavior are the ways to achieve enlightenment or nirvana, a fleeting attempt at peace. With Christ, all the thinking, meditating, and good behavior won't change your heart. Won't get you the peace you're fighting for. The words of John the Baptist came to me. John 3.30 He must become greater, and I must become less. When that is in your CD player in the back of your mind, when we're living life, no matter what we're doing, if in the back of our mind we're saying, I want Christ. You know, you know the passage where John the Baptist, the disciples came to him and said, look, Jesus is getting more popular than you are, man. What should we do? Head him off at the pass? And his first response was, he must become greater. I must become less. So when we're doing all these spiritual things, even in the church, the devil has probably taken up more pews here than we are. Because even in the church, he's going to tr try to derail our motives and derail our psyche. So the series is not a presentation on how we can become more self-reliant, which is a natural conclusion when you think about the word spiritual warrior. <laughs> You're thinking about what I can do. I pumped 220 on the bench. I feel fit going three hours on the bike. I feel like I can do this. And then something happens that puts you in the corner that that didn't mean much. It is becoming more conscious, conscious of God's power that he is willing to use on your behalf. We are in a battle, not a competition. To see who can get the most highest badges and certificates that prove our worth? Yet everything else in life is about that, isn't it? In my field, there's all kinds of badges you can get and all kinds of certificates. Big deal. You know what? In God's world, when you're saved, you're saved. You're a child of God. You're okay. You're accepted. <laughs> you don't need any more certificates. He has an inheritance for you. We're in a battle, not a competition. And Paul was acutely aware of this. He was acutely aware of where his strength came from. 1 Corinthians 9, 27 says, Paul is saying, No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. That's telling me that Paul, the apostle, the black belt level three of Christian spiritual warriors, said this after being probably 80 years old here. He says, after I have spent my life preaching and proclaiming the good news of the gospel, not only with words, but with signs and wonders, I daily watch myself that I wouldn't become a victim. I rely on Christ's strength 
not my own wisdom, not my own intellect, not my own thinking. And the New Living Translation says it like this, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. So we submit ourselves to following the footsteps of a warrior and gleaning what we can from his trail. The warrior of our souls is Jesus Christ. We are not looking at philosophies, but principles for victorious living. You know, there's people that like to sit around and feel each other's warm air on their faces as they philosophize and debate how many angels will fit on the end of a needle. I don't care personally. You know what I do care? That I'm found faithful. I think there's a holy, there is a holy fear that we should all have that says, God, if I face you this second, how am I going to measure up? Am I covered by your blood? Or have I drifted away and said, I got this. I can do this. I feel in control. Psalms 18.3 says, I called on the Lord who is worthy of praise and he saved me from my enemies. <clears throat> yes, we must live like warriors, but understand on our own we can do nothing. In the Old Testament, their battles were quite the ordeal. They had archers, sword bearers, slingshot experts, trumpet blowers, dancers, priests, soldiers, and at the head, at the very front leading the charge was God the warrior, the captain of heaven's armies. Isaiah 8, 13 says, Make the Lord of heaven's armies holy in your life. He is the one you should fear. He is the one who should make you tremble. That's a good verse to memorize. <laughs> God the warrior is not here to respond to every whim we might have. You know, there's, there's probably some teaching out there that says, if you connect the dots in the right way, you can make God do almost anything. <laughs> I wish. It doesn't work that way. You know, we submit to God's will, not God submits to our will. God does not align with our cause. We must align with his will. So in Judges chapter 4 and 5, we have the account of a pretty rare occurrence, if you ask me, in the Old Testament. There is a lady there called Deborah. And God speaks to this lady quite frequently and very specifically. And God tells her, Go and tell Barak, he needs to go and fight with these people. So immediately Deborah goes and says, Hey Barak, you need to go fight against the enemies of God. <clears throat> and then she says, the Lord is telling you this, not me. And like a brave warrior that he is, Barak looks at her and goes, I ain't going nowhere without you going with me. What a man. <laughs> what a brave heart. He said, I'm not going anywhere. If you're willing to come with me, we'll go. Otherwise, cheers, I'm going to McDonald's. She immediately says, yes. But she says, because you're not willing to obey God, the glory for all time will go to me. And think about it. That literally is what it is. Till this day, when you talk about that story, no one remembers really the story, but they do remember Deborah. And yet in this story, I see something. I see, I see a warrior and a woman that is humble. She's a humble woman. You can get the impression that she's a big mouth 
kind of pushy kind of person, but she's not. She's a very humble person. If you examine her words, she was constantly submitting. She was placing herself under his authority, even though she probably was 10 times the warrior he'll ever be. But she was a very humble person. So that tells us something, that you can be a very humble yet powerful person. A warrior is quick to obey the word of the Lord. And you know what else? A warrior is in a position to hear from the Lord. She was sure. This is something I found very interesting. It didn't really hit me until I really thought about it. Was She actually was sure about the victory before the battle even started. Talk about a bizarre person. <laughs> She was not questioning the victory. Read the story. She didn't say, if we win. She said, because you're a gutless, spineless human being, the victory is going to, and the credit will go to me. So she never actually questioned, is there going to be a victory? She said, I know there's going to be a victory. And as a warrior in Christ, there's a good place to get stubborn and say, I don't understand these circumstances. I don't understand why this is happening, but I know God is in control. You know, when I look past the guy that was about ready to pulverize me and I seen the other guy, oh, what a relief. <laughs> You know what? When the devil's got you in that corner, you ain't got no way out. You know you can't beat your way out because he's got you outgunned. But when you look past him and see the power of the cross, I wonder if we have that same, that same confidence saying, I know I'm covered now. I'm okay. The interesting thing is she tried not to take the stage, but she wasn't afraid to take a stand either. You know, sometimes we're, we're not afraid to take the stage, all right, because we're terrified. She didn't want the stage. She didn't want the spotlight, but she wasn't afraid to take a stand. And I think we can learn something there too. She was willing to give all the spotlight to Barak but the weak man was too afraid to take a stand. So she humbly calls him out on his behavior and keeps in step with God's plans. Wow, <laughs> that's insane. When you actually consider the historical climate and what the worth of a woman was during this time, it makes it a really huge, huge statement. She is known to this day as a woman of integrity and honor. When you stand up with God, he brings the victory. War. Yes, there is a war. So there's a need for warriors because there is a war. There is a full-blown attack on your family, on your home, on your happiness, on your self-worth, on your very existence. As a good warrior, do not allow yourself the luxury of being distracted. So a warrior doesn't let himself get distracted. We are in a war, and I think some of us are pretending that it's not happening, but yet it is happening. The call to war came through a trumpet blast in the Old Testament. In Numbers 10, 9, it says, when you go into battle, in your own land against an enemy who is oppressing you, sound a blast on the trumpets. Then you will be remembered by the Lord your God and rescued from your enemies. What, is God blind? Does he need you to blow a trumpet to hear you? <laughs> when you start analyzing some of these statements, you're like, is this for his benefit? I don't think so. He knows all. He sees all. 
He's saying, hey, warrior, say something. Call out to me. Rely on me. The trumpet blast is a symbol of warning, a call to assemble, an alarm for war, an audible sound for help from God. The trumpet blast alerted God of an attack on his people. But God didn't do this for himself. He did that for us. When we're in trouble, it's just an opportunity for him to show his power and grace in our lives. Purity is maintained throughout the camp in war. Did you know that? Did you know soldiers kept purity in Israel? If you think back to, uh, uh, what the heck's his name? Bathsheba and, what was her husband's name? Bathsheba, come on, you losers. <laughs> Uriah. Uriah was her husband. And when David had had sex with Bathsheba, she got pregnant. He sends for Uriah to come back because David didn't want to own up to his lustful habit. So he thought he connived a plan where he could cover his tracks, he thought. But when Uriah came back, Uriah slept with the servants and said, how dare I go home? They maintain purity in the camp. In the time of war, the warriors kept himself or herself pure. If God is to be active in our lives, we must allow the cleansing work of the Holy Spirit to be active in pointing out or removing habits, thought patterns, and hindrances that deter us from personal purity before him. Everyone equates purity with just sex. No. The Holy Spirit wants to point out to each one of us. There's, there might be habits. There might be thought patterns that aren't pure either. And they are hindrances that deter us from personal purity before him. Sacrifices were made to Yahweh. He is consulted. A warrior does not go off half-cocked on an impulse in a rage, but seeks God and patiently listens for the sometimes soft, still voice that leads our footsteps. And you know, in these wars, the leaders, the pastors, the elders, the mature people of faith proclaim to everyone, God is not only with them, but he will fight for them. And that's actually why we have... Uh, well, except when I forget almost all the time, testimonies. That's what it is. It's to spur one another on towards good works. It's to say, God's not only saved my soul, he's doing this in my life too. The, arm, the army marches out with certainty. Now a passage in the New Testament, because I know what you know what the devil always does, right? He'll whisper in your ear. He's talking about the Old Testament. That's not even applicable nowadays. Come on, get real. Well, <laughs> let's move up to the New Testament, y'all. <laughs> so let's go to Acts. Acts 19:15. This one is quite intimidating if you're not in a pure position. <laughs> Acts 19.15 says, One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? <laughs> and he proceeded to beat the ever-living beep out of them. <laughs> so the point of that passage, I think, would be purity. Would be to be in a position where we're hearing from God, to be in a position we're actually knowing God is going to be our defender. 
A wise warrior is not relying on second-hand info. You know what? It's okay. Get greedy. Say, God, I heard a testimony of a guy, and he kept saying, and the testimony boiled down to this. He said, I got to a point in my life, I'd been in ministry for I don't know how many years, he said, but I hadn't experienced any of God's power in my ministry. Nothing. He said, I knew all the answers. I knew all the teachings. I knew all the theology, but I hadn't experienced any of God's power. He said, I just got so frustrated with it. I just made it my number one mission. <laughs> and he said, it hit me. And he said, when it hit me, it changed me. And this guy is a very soft-spoken person, not the kind of guy you're thinking. He was a quiet man, a gentle man. But he said, God, I'm faithful. But I'm just faithful at spewing out stuff that I've learned. I need the living, active word. Not just the words off a page that you can teach a monkey to probably read. Or at least a pig. I don't know which, which one's smarter. Who knows? Until the word becomes living, what does it say? The letter of the law kills. The spirit brings life. It's okay if we look in the mirror and say, God, I, I know all the theology. I know all the right answers. I need this to become alive to me. I need this word to take root for me in a real way. Before you enter into the spiritual realm, make sure it is with God's presence you do so. The Father's will is of the utmost importance in spiritual battles. Seek wisdom from on high. Understand firsthand the Father's will. And you know what I think is awesome? You know what one of the last things they would say when they would go out to war? That all the leaders would say, Do not be anyone, anyone, anyone from the three, four hundred thousand people that are in here. Anyway. <laughs> Don't be afraid. <laughs> Deuteronomy 20 verse 1 says, When you go to war against your enemy and see horses and chariots and an army greater than yours, do not be afraid of them. Because the Lord your God, who brought you out of, it says Egypt, but we can easily put the word sin. The Lord your God, who brought you out of your sinful past, will be with you. And you know what? In that passage, go down to verse 8. It says, if you're afraid, go home. A warrior prepares their hearts for battle. Don't walk onto the playing field until you've had power infused into your being, until circumstances is your slave and not your master. Right? In a lot of time, in a lot of ways, circumstance tries to dictate everything in our in our mental state and in our emotional well-being. I'm like, no, gain control over that and make circumstance your slave, not your master. The call to be a warrior is a call to embrace long-term, no one wants to hear this, I can promise you that, long-term sacrifice. No one's gonna tell me that being a warrior and camping out in the boonies and roughing it every single day is fun. I don't think so. And I'm not saying that's what we have to do, but spiritually speaking, we might have to. There might be things that come our way that are very tough and that we have to slug out daily and make it our slave, not our master. Then we need to remove pride from our lives. <clears throat> I actually copied down the army ethos, what they believe. 
Number one, I will always place the mission first. Well, let's translate that into New Testament. You have been bought with a price. You are not your own. I will never accept defeat. Well, let's... I am more than an overcomer. <laughs> I will never quit. This one, I think, I wish Christians would really get this in their hearts. I will never leave a fallen comrade. And I think the church has been so guilty of this, it's not even funny. Someone fails and falls, and we in our love and care get on high heels or spikes and stomp them to death. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice if the DNA of Gwyn Church could be that of restoration? That doesn't mean you don't hold people accountable. But when your heart bleeds because they failed, I think it sets you apart. It's easy to judge someone. It's hard to have compassion on someone when you think they should be getting the beating that they're getting. But Job said, if you were really a friend of mine, you would stand by me even if I was guilty. And I thought we could learn something from that, I guess. What derails a warrior? What derails a warrior? Four letter word, 20 points, first letter is F. Fear. <laughs> Gerald wins again. <laughs> what derails almost anyone is fear. I didn't go in for the uh, executive position. I went and applied for the janitorial position because I was too scared. Even though I had the training, I had the Bachelor of Arts certificate, I was too scared. Now there's a difference between fantasy and fear. Fantasy says I have no training and I'm going in for the top position, vice president of the company. And here's my happy meal to prove I'm qualified. <laughs> oh. But a lot of times you are in a position to take way more ground than you're taking because you forget a lot of your qualifications came from your father that he gave you as part of the inheritance that he promised you and we're throwing it to the side saying I don't believe you God that's really what we're saying I don't believe you God I'm scared the debilitating effects of fear it kills it destroys it limits and it stops warriors dead in their tracks if fear can creep into your heart it will work its way through your psyche and destroy hope in your heart it's a poison it is cancer for the soul it says God is not here he is not big enough and he doesn't care that's really what it says Immediate action is required on our part. Army Rangers and Navy SEALs agree, and I took this right out of their stuff. One of the most effective ways to deal with fear is to laugh about it. <laughs> and then I immediately pops in my head. What is our strength in the Lord? What does it say? There's a direct passage in the Bible that says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And take it a step further. What is Satan guilty of the most? Pride. How do you feel if you're an arrogant, pride-filled schmuck and someone comes up to you and laughs in your face? Some puny wimp. And you're so much bigger, supposedly. And that little puny wimp looks at you and goes, starts laughing and goes, You can't touch me. You haven't had permission. I'm covered. I've been bought by, by the blood of the Lamb. All of a sudden, perspective starts changing how we feel inside. We all of a sudden start having the heart of a warrior. Now, like Abby said, I'm not going to go through this whole introduction this time. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not that cruel. 
I just have to remember where I'm leaving off and then we're good. Um, yeah, we're almost down here, so that's probably good enough. So Lord, we, we're going to submit this time to you and we're going to give you permission to not only work, you know, a lot of times we pray a third person, like for those guys out there. But today we want to say, God, we give you permission to work in our lives, to clean up the things in our psyche, in our hearts, to remove the fear, to remove the ignorance that doesn't understand that you're there saying, blow the trumpet. I'm here. You're blowing the trumpet for yourself. So you remind yourself that, that I'm here already. I'm already working on your, on your behalf. You need to trust me. You need to remember you're my child. You're bought with a price. You're no longer your own. I've given you access to my throne, my throne room of grace. And I will hold you. I will carry you if I have to. Because guess what? I'm not leaving you behind. I'm going to go before you. I'm going to clear the trail. When the fires try to burn you, you're going to come through that without, what does it say? Without even the smell of smoke on you. God is here to empower each one of us to live victorious. Why? So we can feel good about ourselves? No. That's only a small part of it. It's so that you can actually genuinely shine your light to a world that is so fearful, that is so given up on hope, that is so lost that they just don't care anymore. Oh God, change us that we will be a light, that we will be ointment, that we will be your hands, that we will speak your words, and your words are life, your words are restoration, your words are healing and you're not a master of pretending things aren't happening you're the master of dealing with things that are happening and you move us above and around and on top where the circumstances do not own us but we all of a sudden get a new heart and new confidence in you so we humbly submit all these things into your care and we say, God, change us. In your name we pray, amen.